Hey everybody, welcome to Sandals Church where we are all about this vision of being real. So no matter who you are or where you're watching from, there is a place for you here. And if you're watching today and are maybe wondering how can I dive deeper into this vision, or maybe how can I live this vision of being real out in my life, I'd love to invite you to check out our podcast called The Debrief. It's a podcast where we give real answers to the tough questions that you guys have. So make sure to check that out by going to debrief.show. And if at any time during this message, you want to give to what God is doing through this vision of being real in your life, you can donate by going to donate.se. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoy the message. Good morning, Sandals Church. Yes. Man, I'm super glad you guys are here today. So glad that you came. And if you're a family member that's been invited today, I apologize. Today we're talking about family drama. Who's had family drama? Yes. If you got no drama, you got no mama. Amen? That's a reality. That's a reality. Look, man, we deal with drama at work. We do deal with drama at school. There's something about family drama that just makes it just that much harder to deal with. And let me just say this. If you've never had family drama, it's coming, amen, the rest of us, it's coming. You just haven't lived long enough or uh, you're just total avoidant. So let's talk about why family drama is hard. And I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I do think I'm right. (laughs) I don't know why you're laughing. All right, why is family drama so hard? Number one, expectations, oh my Lord. We have expectations for our parents, siblings, and add in there, and spouses. A couple years ago, I was out to lunch at a Denny's, and, uh, and don't judge, but I was at Denny's, and there was this old lady reading a romance novel, and she was reading this romance novel. You ever seen these novels? Like the book, the guy has like long hair, and his chest is out, and he's riding like a horse or a dragon, you know, you pick. And she's like 90 years old, man, and she's reading this book, and she's reading, and she's looking at me, and she's reading it. And I used to have long hair. And I'm like, it's getting weird. And so finally I said, can I help you? And she said, do you mind if I gaze into your eyes? I was like, gaze away, right? You know, what am I I gonna say? And it was just awkward. I'm thinking, this poor lady's gonna go home to her 95-year-old husband who's not been on a dragon ever. Um, And just, you just have all these unrealistic expectations. And, And now, you know, some of you guys, you're getting engaged and that's like a whole theatrical production because you saw somebody did something on Instagram and we just have these huge level of expectations, and especially for our parents. And let me just tell you this. When you're a kid, you think your parents have the answers. And then when you become a parent, and you realize you have no answers. Like, you don't know what you're doing. The first infant I ever held was my own. That's not a good way to start. Guys, volunteer in kids' ministry. Start practicing, right? Not with your own kid, but somebody else's that you just have for an hour, amen? All right. But we have expectations. And so a lot of us get hurt because we go into these relationships expecting our mom to be this way, our dad to be this way, or mother-in-law to be this way, right? Our father-in-law to be this way. And we have these huge expectations and we get hurt. Next, oh, this is so true, emotional intensity. Like if you're freaking out on the freeway, that's a you problem. But when it's your family, that's a real problem. Like if you're on the freeway and somebody cuts you off and you're like, I need to follow them all the way to work to discuss this, You need counseling. But when it comes to your marriage, it matters. It matters. And those of you who don't have kids yet, you lie to yourself. When I have kids, I'm gonna lie right now is what you're doing. Because you know why? The kid's not real and you really don't care yet. The kid's this made up thing. And then one day you get a real kid and you're like, oh my gosh, I really care. I'm gonna puke, I'm gonna poop. I don't know what's gonna happen. Because it matters. When you're fighting with someone that you love, it's intense because You love one another and you care for one another. I can read all kinds of books about how to listen to your wife, how to not freak out, not how to spaz out. As soon as my wife's like, we need to talk, I'm like, because I get all upset 
because it matters, it matters, it's real. And so literally somebody, Jesus Christ himself could be standing next to you. You need to not respond that way. You're like, listen, Jesus. Because it's very, very real and it's very, very personal. So there's an emotional intensity. So just understand that. When you're fighting with your spouse, when you, when you have a disagreement with your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, it matters. That's why it's hard. Next, oh, this, I wish this wasn't true, but it is the power of negative memories. What is it with us? You could tell me you love me every single day and I will never remember you saying that or your name, but you're like, I hated your sermon. I'm like, I know you forever. Isn't it amazing that most of us, our memories from our parents are just negative memories? Our, our memories from our siblings are, 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 are mostly negative memories. There's something that happens when we feel like we're being attacked or we're being criticized or something bad is happening to us. We just like lock that away forever. And so when you're dealing with family, you're not just dealing with the moment, you're dealing with all the bad moments. And so when Tammy and I are arguing, because she's slow to repent, right? When we're arguing, it's not just me and her, it's me, her, and all the stupid Matt Browns for 20 something years of marriage. And they're all in there and she remembers everything. She has no idea what I'm gonna do on Tuesday, but she knows what I did Tuesday 27 years ago when I said something dumb. Just know that. And parents, you gotta know this, man. When you have a negative encounter with your kid, you, you, you gotta deal with it because they're not gonna forget it. We were on vacation. Parents, you ever just decide, yeah, I wanna take our kids on vacation, then you do and you're like, why did we take our kids on vacation? <laughs> did we need more stress, more misery? So we took our kids on vacation and maybe it's just me, but dads, I lost it. I know it's hard for you to believe because I'm so much like Jesus, <laughs> but I, I don't know why you're laughing, that hurts. I lost, I lo dads, I lost my mind. I lost my mind, and my super empower is I turn into the Incredible Hulk, and I literally went crazy on my son. And this is how I know I went great. I went crazy, because as I was lunging towards my son, my wife dove. She dove, she was gonna sacrifice her life for her son. She dove in the middle of us and yells out, don't do anything you'll regret. And I said, I will not regret anything I am about to do. So those are dads, are like, oh yeah, I've been there. <laughs> but you know what I told my son afterwards when I apologized? I said, I I'm so sorry for what I did and how I did it. I said, here's the thing that bothers me. 20 years from now, you'll not remember one of the good things we did on this vacation, but you'll remember dad turning into the Hulk. And that bums me out because this vacation has been robbed from us. That's the power of negative emotions and negative encounters. And literally, you can have a great marriage and you get one fight, you're like, oh my gosh, it's destroyed forever, because they're powerful. Next, the embarrassment over sin and mistakes. Like some of your families, they're just not real. Do you know how many funerals I've done where, where, where kids find out their parents were married to other people? Like, my dad was married, he has 27 kids. Whoa, what happened? And so what we do oftentimes in our families is we don't deal with the embarrassment, we don't deal with the sin, and we sweep it under the rug. And this is different for all kinds of families for all different reasons. And it, and it matters, you know, like what ethnicity you are. Like if you're a white person, man, you'll go on Oprah for 10 bucks to throw your family under the bus, right? You're like, yeah. But if you're from another ethnicity, some, some, some families, man, you don't, you don't poke the bear. You don't do that, and we just pretend that nothing ever happened, and we just sweep that under the rug. So you go around trying to, well, I, I go to this church, and our vision is to be real. They're like, you need to knock that off. You need to stop that right now. Our vision is to be unreal with ourselves, God, and others. Things happen, and they're embarrassing. Next, there's a difference in age, upbringing, and perspective. You know the family's the only place where you have four-year-olds and seventh graders that hang out? There's no, there's no other place in the world where like, we don't even do that in school, but in the family you can have different ages. Literally, you go to different schools. 
And now we have this thing called blended families because that's fun, right? And so we have blended families, we have second families, third families, we, we have all this stuff together. And then we have generations. Like we were going through some, some family photos and my kids, they always laugh at our pictures, you know, way back in the olden days called the 90s. And my kids are like, oh my gosh, dad, look at your photo, look at your face. <laughs> Well, let me tell you something, young people. We didn't take a thousand pictures. Mm, 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 mm. And pick the perfect one. Somebody just snuck a photo, didn't tell you, and then put the film like, like in the refrigerator for a month, and then you collect it all together. You take it to Walgreens and some weirdo you don't even know looks at him first. and then hands them to you in an envelope. <laughs> like, our photos are real. We're like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> it's just different. It's different. You can't imagine, you know, well, why didn't you just delete it? It was film. <laughs> you can't delete it, man. And let me just say this, if you don't deal with your family drama now, your drama will deal with you when you least expect it. You know, I was, I was saying this in all my sermons, I said, I I've done funerals where we had to call the police. And one of the guys volunteering for security told me that you know, he works military funerals and he, he said it, he doesn't even know how many times a fight breaks loose over who gets the flag. Can you imagine that? Do you know why all that hurt? You're saving that for later. And it comes out when we grieve. And that's what happens in Genesis chapter 50. If, if you feel bad about your family, read the Bible. You'll feel so good. Parents, if you're like, I'm a terrible parent, read Genesis 4. They got two kids. One kills the other. You're like, okay, well, we just got one in jail. We're not doing that bad. And it gets progressively worse. Each family, each generation, it gets so bad in Noah's time, God's like, we got to start over. It's that bad. We get to Genesis 50, and, and we, we got the promised family, the family of Abraham, the family of Isaac, the family of Jacob. This is the family that creates the family called Israel. But they're jacked. They're messed up. And so Jacob, who, whose name it literally becomes Israel, he, because all of his sons become the 12 tribes of Israel, man, he, he's like the worst, and he has all these issues, and he dies. And listen to me, parents. He didn't help his children through the issues. And so they saved it for his funeral. In chapter 50, verse 15, it says, and now that their father was dead, oh my gosh, grief is bad enough on its own. It's even worse when you have to deal with drama. And now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers they became fearful. He said, Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him. You see, here's the situation. Joseph's the little brother. How many of you guys had little brothers, little sisters? Raise your hands. Do you ever do things that you're not proud of? Like, for example, when I was in seventh grade, I thought I was gonna be a hairstylist. <laughs> Don't laugh. I was gonna be a hairstylist, and so I practiced on my dog a couple times. I got some dog clippers, and then I practiced on my little brother. It's not a good moment. It's just, it's not a good moment. Thank God he's not like the king, because uh, I might be getting haircuts every Friday. But Joseph didn't get weird haircuts from his brothers. They actually cut him off from his family. They saw Joseph coming while they were working in the field, and Joseph had a fancy coat that his dad had bought him. He wore that everywhere. He showed up. They said, look, here comes a little brother. He's a little snot. And they plotted against him to kill him. Ten of the brothers wanted to kill him. One of them said, let's not kill him. Let's wait till later. They end up selling him. They trafficked their own brother. They sold their brother into slavery. 
And they send him to Egypt. He doesn't speak the language. He doesn't know the culture. He's never eaten the food. He's literally a slave in a foreign country because his brothers sold him. And they took that fancy coat and they cut it up and they poured animal blood on it and they took it to their dad and they said, dad, an animal killed Joseph. You feeling better about your family? Some of you are like, nope, that's my family. <laughs> that is my story. So they're afraid he's gonna pay him back for all the wrong he did, because here's what happened. They sent Joseph off to Egypt as a slave, and he became the second most powerful person in Egypt. God blessed him. And in Israel, there was a great famine, and they were starving, and literally Joseph and all his brothers and their father came to Egypt because there was no food in the land. They were gonna die, and the brother they sold and left for dead is the brother that fed them and watched over them and cared for them, but now they're like, Dad's dead. He's gonna kill us now. So they sent this text message to Joseph. <laughs> hey, before our father died, well, I said it wrong. Before your father died, that's interesting. He instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of your God, your Father, the God of your Father, beg you to forgive our sin. Underline this. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. Sometimes the path to healing is weeping. Some of you have been hurt. Some of you have been hurt. And I want you to know that if you're ever gonna heal, you might have to hurt a little bit more to get to the other side. In every service that I've preached this weekend, at some point, somebody gets up and walks out because it's too much. Look, I don't know what's happened in your life, but I know this, that if you want Jesus to heal it, you need to sit in it for a second and hear what God has to say about your problem. He broke down and he wept, and then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. They said, look, we're your slaves. You're like, well, I'd forgive my mom and dad if they became my slave. But Joseph says, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He says, am I God that I can punish you? Now, I want you to know Joseph didn't live in America. There's no Bill of Rights. His brothers don't have any rights. They're not even citizens in Egypt. Joseph can literally hang his brothers from their ankles and watch them starve in the streets, and the Egyptians don't care. But he says, am I God? Am I God to punish you? He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You see, some of the worst things in your life are gonna lead you to the best places in your life if you let God handle it. He brought me into this position so I could save the lives of many people. He says, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. And so he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. You know why? It's not just what we say, it's how we say it. Like he could have been like, I won't kill you. I promise. He said, guys, I'm not gonna kill you. We were young, you were stupid. You tried to hurt me, but God meant it not just to save me, but to save us. So to deal with your family drama, I wanna challenge you to do a couple things. Number one, I wanna challenge you to do your part to bring healing. You see, some of you today, you're asking God to fix your family when God is calling you to face your family. That's what we do. Oh, God, fix it. Some of you, right now in church, you're throwing Jesus grenades at your relatives. Oh, I hope they hear this. <laughs> right down, point two. <laughs> Stop trying to bomb your family with the Holy Spirit and listen to what Jesus has to say. This is one of the most bizarre passages in the gospel and many of you have read it and never thought about what it means. Someone called from the crowd, it's, it's a Jesus rally. They're wearing make Israel great 
Again, hats, right? <laughs> Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. So, so dad's dead, very similar. Brothers are fighting, very similar. And somebody calls out from the crowd, hey, Jesus, fix my jacked up family. And Jesus says, who made me judge over you to decide such things? Isn't this interesting? Jesus is the judge of the world, and he says, you deal with your family crap. Whoa! He just lobbed a Holy Spirit grenade right back. <laughs> Look, if you want God, if you want God to intervene in your family, maybe you need to learn what Jesus wants you to do. Quit praying to Jesus actually pick up the phone and call your family member and say, I'm sorry. I just talked to somebody last service, 72 years old. She said, Pastor, I'm gonna call my daughter as soon as I get home because we haven't spoken. And she said, that's not right. Quit praying for your daughter and call your daughter. Quit praying for your mom, call your mom. Quit praying for your dad, call your dad. And just say, look, man, I'm sorry that this has happened. You see, Jesus doesn't fix families when we sit in foxholes waiting for God to move. So we're in this series called Relational Remix where we're looking at the Enneagram and the Enneagram divides us up into nine different personality types. We see the world differently, we deal with the world differently and we deal with drama differently. And so here's the thing, some of you are like, well, I wonder what my mother-in-law is, she's jacked up, what could she be? Unhealthy, that's a given. But let me tell you something, instead of trying to figure out what number they are, I want you to figure out what number you are because I don't know how they're going to deal with their problems, but Jesus wants to know how you're gonna deal with your problem. Stop running around waiting for somebody else to get it right, you gotta get it right and say, how do I handle this? So I want you to do your part to bring healing. So as an eight, I always start with the eights because you can handle it, amen? You're like, bring it on, challenge me, pastor. <laughs> You're challengers, I love you. You don't run from problems, you run at them. But here's the problem, you gotta deal with the issue, but don't destroy your family. You're like, problem solved. I'm like, well, they're all dead. <laughs> exactly. That's what I did when I was on vacation. I became an eight, destroyed my son. My wife was Jesus. Don't kill us all. You gotta deal with the issue, but don't destroy the family. Eights, what you're trying to do is protect your family, and oftentimes the thing that's the most dangerous to your family is you. Peacemakers. And some of you are just like literally shrinking right now. I am never calling my mother. And you know why that's so sad? Because you're the very best in conflict. Listen to me, nines, God's given you a gift of seeing both sides. The problem is if you don't use your gift, the eights are gonna fix it and we're all dead. <laughs> we need you. Use your gifting, but here's the thing. You gotta declare what's right. So if you're sitting there with Joseph's brothers and Joseph, you're like, well, what did Joseph do? He's like, well, I got sold into slavery. You're like, hmm, and what did you guys do? We sold him into slavery, hmm. Who's wrong? <laughs> the 10 brothers. You can't be like, well, let's consider every side. Sometimes there's a right and sometimes there's a wrong and nines, you gotta declare it. Ones, scratch out the word don't, that's wrong. And I know you'd notice. Ones, I want you to focus only on the big picture or lose connection. How many of you ones noticed that the brothers said, before dad died, he told us? And you're like, I sniff a lie. I smell a little lie. I think you guys just fibbed. I know you men of integrity who sell your brother into slavery would never tell a lie. Let me ask you ones, what's more important, whether or not they told the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help them God, or restoring your relationship with your jacked up brothers? You see, ones, you can get so caught up in the weeds and you're literally like so caught up on everything they've said that's wrong, 
eventually you lose connection with the person you want a relationship with. You can't, you can't go through life going foul, 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 foul. You can't do that. You got to look at the big picture. My son was in swimming, and let's be honest, he was never in danger of being Michael Phelps. <laughs> he was in swimming, and let me tell you something, parents, pick a sport that exhausts your children. <laughs> swimming is a great sport because if they rest too long, they drown. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's a great sport, it's wonderful. You don't have to go anywhere, you just watch. <laughs> Get a massage afterwards, your neck will be better. But my son, you know, like a lot of sports, if you don't start when you're super small, you're, you're kind of behind. And so, you know, he, he hadn't done it, and, but eventually he got good at one event, and he made the finals. He made the finals in this one event, and it was a big, big deal. And he came in last place, which was fine, because everybody in the finals gets an award except for the fact that the ref disqualified him for something he did wrong. And I went up to the ref. I'm like, he came in last. He says, yeah, but he did something wrong. I said, it doesn't matter. He came in last. It's not like you're penalizing another kid. He says, rules are rules. And you know, my son quit swimming and never went back. One's, what's the goal? Rules are rules. Well, do you want to maintain a relationship? Do you want to maintain the connection? Because I got some stupid adult that made swimming unbearable for my kid. He came in last, doesn't matter. Then we got the helper, I love you. You're like, I'll solve it. I will help, I have superpowers. Listen to me, helpers. Sometimes the best thing you can do is not get involved at all. I'm gonna talk to the moms. You're like, I will make them all get along. Everyone will have a great family. Listen to me, moms. Sometimes brothers gotta figure it out. They gotta figure it out. If you solve all their problems, you're gonna screw it up. Step back and allow others to figure it out. Because if you solve the problem, listen to me, the problem's not solved. Threes, I love you, but you gotta see the person and the relationship as the goal. You're like, I shredded them in that argument. You walk into family drama like a lawyer. We are gathered here today, and I've been studying family law. Guilty, I say, right? And you just shred people. What's the goal? Winning the argument? Threes, we're gonna have Thanksgiving. What if you're the only Trump supporter in your family? You got your MAGA hat on? <laughs> what, if, what if you're the only Democrat in your family? Let me tell you something, there are idiots on both sides. Last, last, last Easter, we got idiots on both sides in my family. We got a stupid Republican and a stupid Democrat, and they found each other at the dinner table. <laughs> it's like they fell in love. Oh. Dude, I just wanted to eat my ham and go into a Jesus coma for the afternoon. And I told my wife, I said, babe, the idiots have found each other. We are going home. Do you know why? They don't care about each other. They just want to lob political grenades. Ha ha, boom, ha ha, boom. And they both go home. I really shredded that person. The only thing you destroyed was Easter meal. Listen to me, you can win and still lose threes. Individualist, I love you. You can't cry all the time. <laughs> Do you know why? Your tears, they, it feels like manipulation. Here's what I want to challenge you. Don't allow emotion to cloud your judgment. I would thought we were supposed to judge people. Well, you haven't read the whole Bible. You're supposed to have judgment. And you need to disengage from your emotions a little bit for you to have judgment. 
Five observers, your exact opposite. I need you to cry. It would shock your family. <laughs> Express your feelings as you share your thoughts. Five, you enter into family conflict like a lab technician. Got your little lab coat on, gonna observe you guys. Shed a tear, your kids would literally be like, I didn't know dad did that. <laughs> Sixes, I love you. You gotta share your fears, but listen to others' words. Because what sixes do is you attach meanings to words, sometimes even before the words are spoken. You're like, I wanna talk about dinner. I hear what you're saying, divorce. <laughs> what? What just happened? Sevens. Yes. Yes, I love the sevens. Sevens, would you do me a favor? Would you work hard just to not give up if it's not going well? You're like, I'm just gonna get on 23andMe.com. I bet I have relatives somewhere else. <laughs> and they're gonna be more fun. All right. So whenever you go into conflict, I wanna challenge you. Own, own your part. Own my part. If you come into family conflict self-righteous, the righteousness of God will never come about. Own your part. So if I sat down with Joseph, Jacob, and the brothers, I'd start with Joseph. Joseph, what'd you do wrong? He's like, nothing. They kidnapped me and sold me into slavery. I got that. But you do know you were a little snot, right? Some of you parents, you constantly bust the older kid because they're bigger and stronger, but you don't deal with the little snot. You got a little terrorist running around your house. No. <laughs> Say, Joseph, you need to be nicer. Joseph was responsible for arrogance. Jacob was responsible for preference. Parents, you wanna jack up your kids? Have a favorite. When our kids were little, we'd have cereal, put the cereal out, none of the kids would eat their cereal until they made sure that every bowl was equal. <laughs> then they would always corner me, Dad, who do you like the most? <laughs> who do you like? I said, you wanna know? Yeah, I'll tell you, come here. Your mother. <laughs> That's who I like the most. I know it's me, Dad, I know it's me. It's your mom. <laughs> Here's the point where I've, I've lost people in almost every service. If you want to deal with family drama in a way that honors God, you gotta honor your family. And some of you are like, nope. Listen, I love you. But if you wanna go to a church where you pick the commandments you follow, then you've picked the wrong church. We don't follow commandments because they're easy. We don't follow commandments because we agree with them. We follow commandments because they're commanded by God. The Bible says if you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on earth. Let me tell you this, parents. Some of you right now are showing your kids how to treat you when you age. You know, I'm going in a home. Yep, you are. <laughs> you are. You know what you don't know until you know it? What it feels like to be old. You don't know. You don't know what it's like. Well, they're cranky. Well, you might be too when you're 95. You wake up every morning shocked. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. All right. Next, navigate difficult family members. I want you to think about who's the most difficult family member. And if you can't come up with them, <laughs> it might be you. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah pastor was preaching this weekend. He said, every family has a difficult family member. I don't think we have one. Everybody's like. <laughs> you gotta navigate difficult family members. And then you gotta avoid destructive ones. Some of you, 
you love Jesus, but you're stupid. <laughs> like, if you have a family member that's going to kill you, you can love them from afar. <laughs> How about for Christmas, we exchange cards? <laughs> you give me your address, and I'll give you my P.O. box. <laughs> right? Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making an allowance for each other's faults. Why? Because of your love. People are irritating. So are you. So am I. I know it's hard for you to believe. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Look, if you're ever gonna have the family you want to, you gotta make an allowance. So next time a family member ticks you off, just give them a Jesus dollar. Here you go. Here you go. And they're like, what is this? Your allowance. Navigate difficult family members and avoid destructive ones. Next, you gotta be ready to forgive. Some of you have been really, really hurt by family members. I want you to imagine the family member that's hurt you the most, they're in church somewhere else today. You're like, they're not in church, they're going to hell. Well, let's just imagine. <laughs> let's imagine they're in church somewhere else today and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that awoken you from your sin, the same Holy Spirit that awoken you to your faith in Jesus Christ, that same Spirit convicts that family member who hurt you, who wounded you. And I don't know what they did to you, but let's just say they sold you into slavery. Would you be willing to forgive them if they were genuinely sorry? Here's what the Bible says. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven us. Do you know why you have a relationship with God? Because you were really sorry. And you told God, I'm sorry. And this is how bad of a thing that you did. What you did was so bad, God had to kill his son, Jesus Christ, to save you. That's how bad it was. That's how dark it was. And yet, when you ask God to forgive you, he forgives you and he punishes his son, Jesus Christ, in your place. And you're like, yep, I can't forgive, then maybe you haven't been forgiven. Ephesians 4.31, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do you know how we do that? With bitterness. Here's how I wanna challenge you to handle family drama. Don't give in to bitterness if it doesn't go your way or the way you thought it should. And let me just say this. Most family conflicts don't go well. Do you know why? They involve people. And if you've forgotten the first list of things, all the things that I went through, you're dealing with all those things when you deal with your family. Don't give in to bitterness. The Bible says don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, as well as all types of evil behavior. And some of you are like, I'm not angry. I'm just righteous. And your face says you're angry. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When you, when you give into bitterness, you give up your intimacy with God. Think about that, there's not room for both. There's not room for bitterness in your heart and the presence of God. So you gotta get rid of bitterness, you gotta get rid of rage, you gotta get rid of anger, you gotta get rid of harsh words. And some of you say, well I don't have that. And the Holy Spirit says, well let's look at your social media profile. And you're like, oh. We live in a world that's bitter, that says harsh words every day about everyone. That's not for you if you're a Christian. Tammy and I were out to dinner and we were talking about some family drama that we've had. And on the way home, I said, we gotta be so careful when we're critical. We gotta be so careful when we're negative. And here's why, when you're critical and negative of people, you've just invited the devil into your life. Jesus is a savior, the devil is an accuser. And when you find yourself accusing, 
That's not the Spirit of God working in your life. Last point. I know some of you guys, you don't have a lot of hope. And I know that family issues are so sensitive for you. I want you to know this. God is with you. You have a whole family in heaven you've never met. Did you know that? You have a family in heaven that's praying for you right now. They're on their knees for you right now. They can't wait to meet you right after you hug Jesus and you walk, on those, walk through those pearly gates. You have a family in heaven that is devoted to you forever and they see your hurt, they recognize your pain and they'll never give up on you because they've been changed by the love of Jesus. But right now you're walking in the midst of pain and heartache. And some of these people that have hurt you claim to be Christians and it doesn't make any sense. I don't want you to try to make sense of it. I want you to trust, write this down, God in the process. You don't think there were moments where Joseph said, this doesn't make any sense? Joseph literally was sold into slavery. Then then he got sent to prison because he did the right thing. He did the right thing. And there's all that time in the prison. There's all that time trying to learn a new language, trying to learn a new culture. There's all that time where he thought God had given up on him. And here he is, the second most powerful man in Egypt. And he says, what you intended to harm me, God intended for good. Romans 8, 28 says this, God uses all things to good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. There is no evil that Satan can bring into your life that God can't flip to benefit your life. Trust God in the process. I wanna close today by praying over you. And I know this is a sensitive thing, so let's bow our heads and close our eyes out of respect for each other. But if you got family drama that's weighing you down, would you just lift your hand so I can pray over you? I want you to know right now that God sees your hand, God sees your heartache, and God loves you. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you empower these people who've listed their hands, Lord, with strength, strength from heaven to deal with the hell on earth. God, I pray that you give them the power to forgive, the power to love, and the power to be like Jesus in the midst of this family drama. Bring healing, Jesus. But Lord, if healing is not in your will, I pray that they would have faith and trust you in the process. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. I love you, Sandals Church. God bless. Here at Sandals Church, we really do believe that this vision of being real can change the world because Sandals Church is a nonprofit that operates from donations from people like you because when you donate, your money goes to creating places for people to be real all over this world. So man, I would love for you to be a part of that and you can make a donation today by clicking the link on this video or going to donate.se. So join us and join what God is doing through this vision of being real and have a great day.